the stat was that the sale was in December 2007. So if anyone's old enough to remember what happened in the end of 2007, um, you know, it was a, a lucky move. <laughs> um, setting that aside, uh, the concept behind Life Sherpa was to be able to offer um, financial advice um, to younger people, that's primarily those between 25 and 45, who don't have much, in, by the way, of investable assets. Um, and what are they looking for? Well, they're clearly not looking for investment advice because they don't have money to invest, but they are looking for help with paying off their debts, budgeting, saving for the first home, um, getting their super sorted, um, insurance. So all of those financial services that, um, that we need, but that the existing industry with its focus on assets under management fees wasn't able to, to deliver. So we built a, um, an online tool, uh, which we call the Freedom Factor, Financial Freedom Factor, which gives you a, a diagnosis of where you are uh, based on our eight step methodology and um, then gives you tips and tools for improving your score. And through that process, the uh, member fills out their fact find in really small digestible chunks and gets guided towards where they might actually need some help. So by the time they actually engage with a real advisor, and a real advisor is key to all of this, um, they have sort of self-diagnosed a, a problem they need to solve, and the advisor's role therefore is largely one around um, a customer service coaching and guiding them through those processes. And that's where the concept of the, the Sherpa came in. Um, so we recognize that everyone has a, a life summit that they need to, to achieve. Um, they're all different. And what people need is a, a trusty companion to carry the bags and guide them along the way. Uh, we're not about dictating what your summit is. We're here to uh, guide you to whatever your, you decide your summit is. Yeah, good. I, not to get too technical, um, but it, it, I didn't prep you on this question, but is a lot of your advice kind of limited scoped advice because uh, I guess clients are kind of guiding their own advice path and before they talk to an advisor? Yeah, each, each piece of advice, and by advice I mean something that results in a, a product or a statement of advice, is by its very nature what ASIC or calls scalable advice that is it is limited scope so it could be for example you know, a piece of super advice which would might be find my loss super consolidated pick a fund pick an investment choice uh, it could be a an insurance review and recommendation for a risk solution it could be a debt elimination plan um, it could be um, a home loan so each individual piece of advice is scalable in that sense but because it's all based on our eight-step methodology we see it in the context of everybody's of, of someone's entire financial life yeah so we can consider those other implications so if we were doing a piece of investment advice which we don't do very much of but let's assume we were doing it we would know that the person had a, a home loan and we would take that into account in allocating them to a model portfolio yeah. All right. Now let's get stuck into the numbers around your business. Uh, I'm a numbers guy. I like talking about numbers. Um, so yeah, you're in the right business. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, well, I mean, you did talk about how much you guys charge, but um, can you kind of just flesh out your whole charging model for us? Because I know you do uh, insurance advice and, um, and you talk about mortgage broking. So can you just kind of flesh out how you charge and, and the whole remuneration? Yeah. So one, one of the key design aspects I was trying to achieve when I set out to design this whole model was that we would not do asset under management fees, we would not do percentage of deal size fees, we would do everything as a fixed or definable fee. Um, we're also conscious that this particular audience wasn't particularly predisposed to writing large checks for advice or indeed capable of writing large checks for advice. So we concluded that we needed to charge a fixed fee and where there was commissions involved, we would deduct that fee from 
the commissions paid and rebate the balance. So we start with a, a, um, a fixed monthly subscription. So once the member finishes their free trial of the service, which they get 30 days for free, um, we will then charge $15 a month or $100 a year. And then where there's a specific piece of advice, so stuff that there is no commission, so super investments, debt elimination, VATs or fixed fees. So we'll charge $299 for a single piece of advice. Um, and then the, uh, where there is commissions, that is home loans and insurance generally, we will deduct a fixed fee from both the upfront and trail commissions. So um, for a sort of a standard home loan, say a five, six hundred thousand dollar home loan, the fixed fee will be fifteen hundred dollars up front and twenty-five dollars a month, and the balance of the commission will get rebated for so long as you're a member. So a someone borrowing five hundred thousand dollars would get a rebate of about fifteen hundred dollars on settlement and about thirty dollars a month for life. So that anyone who has a home loan or an insurance policy will generally receive more from us than they pay in the subscriptions. So that's it. So the, the concept of that was that we would be then able to say um, um, that no matter how much you borrow or who you borrow from, we get paid the same. So it's not quite the independence definition in the Corps Act, but it's as close as is meaninglessly different for Oh, sorry, Vince. I, I just thought I'd pick up on when you, uh, we had a great discussion a while back around uh, the GST aspect, which yep. advice yep. might be interesting. You put, Vince has put a lot more thought in this than the average average advisor. And uh, do you mind just sharing with the guys your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the things we could have done to fall within that independence definition was to charge the client an explicit fee. Uh, so if we wanted to end up with a net $1,500, as an example, we would have to charge the client 1650 to end up with a net 1500 if we charge them a fee and then rebated them the commissions. Um, whereas by deducting, effectively setting a threshold on how much commission rebate they get, um, we deduct $1,500 and... Um, the balance is available to the client. So there's there's $150 of GST that just disappears out of the system by turning that threshold into an explicit fee. And um, we took the view that um, $150 was a far more important message than a strict definition of independence. That as far as a consumer is concerned, we don't care who you borrow from or how much you borrow, is as good as the word independence. All right, so, so it just helps with the, the lower cost model as well. It's say again, it, it helps with the lower cost model. I think everything it, it does. Um, and yeah, when you talk about lower cost, um, you know, there's a few aspects to getting to low cost without being low quality, um, and that's pretty critical to the to the model. Um, now I'm not sure if you want to touch on this later, but this might be an appropriate time to, to deal with the, the ways you get there. Um, one of the most important elements to getting there, uh, apart from all the systems and processes that go behind it, is having a homogenous client base. That is by having a system that sort of selects out those people with the more complex affairs. So if you if you run an incorporated business, this is as a client. The client runs a uh, incorporated business. They've got a self-managed super fund. They've got a family trust. They don't fit our model. So if you're in one of those categories, um, there's mm -hmm. 19,000 financial planners that will um, will look after you. Um, so those complexities add a lot of cost to the advice process without necessarily adding a huge amount of revenue. Now, for that to work, you've really got to be highly disciplined about client selection. Um, it can be... Um, 
very tempting when you set up a new practice. And I know this from experience that anyone with a pulse and a wallet who walks into your office is a client um, or is a, a prospect that you should follow. But to ta have the discipline to go, actually, you're not the right sort of client for my practice. Therefore, I suggest you wander down the road to Chris or Dave um, is a very difficult lesson to learn. Yeah, yeah. So and, um, it can be so tempting to go, well, this client's about to write me a check. I really should take it. Um, and to be able to say, well, actually, no, because all I'm doing is adding cost to my business later. Mm -hmm. Revenue now is very tempting, but that's a discipline that um, I've learned through bitter experience. Yeah, yes, but, with you, yeah. Vince, I just want to I just want to bring back to the remuneration model. So yep. just to clear it up. So each piece of advice costs the client two hundred and ninety nine dollars. Where there's no commissions, yes. Where there's no commissions. So that's if if they want super investment and debt, you know, reduction advice, that's yep. two ninety times three or just one off. Uh, two two ninety nine times two, yeah. So a debt elimination plan would be two hundred and ninety nine dollars. Yeah. A super plan would be $299. Yep. Okay. And when you are receiving commissions, just to clear it up, I know because I'm, pre I'm pretty slow and it took me a while to understand <laughs> your, uh, uh, your structure. So you're charging the client $25 per month for managing their mortgage. And if their commissions is over and above that, you rebate anything above $25. Correct. And same with insurance commissions. Correct. Yep. So a client, a member who has a home loan, we will receive $1,500 on settlement and rebate the balance. And we will receive $25 a month in on Jane Trails and rebate the balance. Yeah. So as long as they maintain their membership. Yeah, yeah. So just to clear that up, just for everyone watching, the maximum revenue is 780 per client per year. Uh, so it's $65 a month, presuming they've got a mortgage and insurance with you. So if someone has mortgage insurance, that's effectively $50 a month plus the upfront of 1,500 times two plus $15 a month in membership, yes. Yeah, no, no, that's good. Um, all right, so how how big is LifeSherpa at the moment in terms of uh, clients that are on the free plan, clients that are on the pay plan, um, and how big are you planning on getting? I mean, it's still early days for us. We relaunched the product in February of this year. Um, and we did that because we started with a freemium model. So like LinkedIn, where we had a free service and a paid service. And the goal was to recruit someone for the free service and then upsell them to the paid service. And that was proving a fairly difficult communications exercise. So people were signing up for the free trial not for the, for the free service and weren't really able to experience what the paid service might look like without actually signing up. So we scrapped that and relaunched in February of this year with a free trial. So more like Netflix where you get 30 days for free mm. and after that you have to, you have to pay. Um, and that's proven to be a much better conversion exercise. Um, so, to answer your question about volume, we've put about three and a half thousand people through various steps of that platform, whether that's you know, starting off with our money personality assessment, moving right through to home loans and insurance. Um, and that's largely been sort of a proving exercise. So the step now is really to, to grow that out. Um, a thousand members is sort of break even. Yep. And we're looking to get to you know, 10,000 within a, a year or two. So it is a volume game, um, but you know, not a massive volume game. Yeah. I know, you, I know you're bigger around kind of tracking your numbers and, and when we spoke. Yep. Um, so, and one number that you threw out that uh, was mind-boggling for me, and I know people are asking questions already about yep. how do we provide advice for yep. such a low amount, but uh, your client acquisition costs, so how much are you guys willing to pay? Yeah. I mean, I mean that, that is, I think, absolutely critical to the whole advice business is that getting the cost of service down 
lots of work's been done on that. There's plenty of ways of getting the service down, and that's largely around systemizing and process. The thing that um, will kill most of these businesses is the cost of acquiring a client. Um, <coughs> cost of acquiring a client in my old business, the business I sold to Boris, I reckon was about $20,000. And that was without spending a cent on advertising. That was all client referrals. So existing clients referring clients. By the time you have a couple of meetings, you prefer a statement of advice, you, um, you do a review of their existing super. Um, that's a 20, well, that was like a $15,000 exercise and we, we were converting two out of three. So when you're charging client 1.75% and the average client's got a million dollars, that's a great business because you're recruiting a client for less than a year's revenue. So mm. you would do that all day long. Um, when you're dealing with the sort of numbers we're talking about, or you know, the so-called robo-advisors, um, the cost of acquiring a client is absolutely critical. Um, our business model is based on getting to a long-term average client acquisition cost of around $100. Um, and just put that in perspective, I select spend about 160 to acquire a client. Um, the general view in the in the UK is that robo advisor is spending four or five hundred mm. uh, in pounds. That is, Invest Smart publicly claim they're doing about four hundred and are unhappy with it. So they're the sort of numbers you need to get to um, in order to. So if we got a lifetime revenue of a client of about three thousand um, dollars. Therefore, if you can acquire a client for 100, 200, 300, that's a pretty good business. Mm. If you're spending 1,000 or 2,000, um, that, that really doesn't work. And that's really where the whole online engagement model comes in, that we felt that or believe that to get to that sort of $100 number, you need to be acquiring a client outside of the transaction cycle. So if you're trying to find a client who wants a home loan today, um, or insurance policy today, that's an expensive client acquisition. So I think if you want to do, you know, home, home, mortgage broker Balmain um, or mortgage broker Sydney, that's a fifty to seventy dollar click. Mm. Now you work out what your conversion rate from that is. Um, it's going to be pretty hard to acquire a client for a home loan direct for less than a thousand bucks. So if you can acquire a client who is not in the transaction cycle today um, and so that they're in your shop when they do have a transaction, you can acquire them or keep it. But the downside is you need an engagement tool. You need something to engage with them and to keep them engaged while they're going through that process. Yeah. And well, that, I think, is, is the life shaper story. Yeah, and that's that's a perfect segue um, because I would buy a thousand clients if it only cost me a hundred dollars, but I know it, it doesn't cost me a hundred dollars to get a client. So, what type of technology are you using to? Because um, you, you said that you uh, you try and engage with clients before they are buying because it's cheaper, and then you've got to nurture them until they're ready to buy. So, what type of technology are you guys using? Uh, I know. Uh, we talked about how much you spent on technology, so can you kind of flesh that out for everyone? Yeah, um, the primary source of leads has been uh, is either based on content or Facebook, um, and by Facebook I mean Facebook ads rather than content. So our prime, the primary place that we've got most of those three thousand odd people has been through Facebook, and we've been giving away our money personality test. Um, on Facebook, so we've been present buying ads um, on a cost per click basis to give away our money personality test, and that's a psychometric test that looks at thirteen psychological traits that affect how you deal with money, and puts you in one of nine personalities. And we've identified there's a few of those personalities that are particularly prone to be open to our service and we can nurture them based on that personality. But that's been you know, really good. We've been getting um, you know, trial members for $7.50 out of Facebook that way. And that is a scalable 
number. Uh, we had to do a lot of tweaking on that because we were getting a lot of young women, so 18 to 24, who were attracted to the personality test, but had no real interest in financial service. So we need to do a bit of tweaking. And Facebook, of course, skews female, big time. Um, so you've got to be careful of that. So that was all done pay for click and they were in feed ads. Um, we didn't buy any mobile traffic, um, which we need to do something about. It was a deliberate strategy. Despite the fact that mobile traffic was cheaper, that's changing a bit now. <coughs> strategy. The other strategy is content. Um, and we've been using a tool called Out Outbrain, which some of your audience may be familiar with. Outbrain is a service that you can position your articles from your blog or website next to relevant content. So if you've ever looked at the same page website, you will find a suggested article from around the web below that. That is in most cases powered by Outbrain. So you tell Outbrain, I want to position this article to articles that are in this segment in this geographic market. And that's been getting us and that's really quality relevant traffic. We can then cookie them their browsers and then use them to retail. For someone who's been reading an article about first home buyer or rent vesting, there's an article about um, yeah, why rent vesting might make sense, for example. Um, mm. That's a quality, qualified, relatively qualified um, prospect, and we can then cookie their browser and present them with um, uh, you know, targeted adverts using Google AdWords. And you yeah. Get more for your buck. So your present your your click through rate goes up, and your relevancy score goes up. So both of those lead to cheaper AdWords. So they're the primary tools. Um, so there's a, I'll, I'll just follow on a few more questions. Um, yeah, sure. A lot of people are asking about how you provide the advice um, yeah. at that price point. And yeah. I know you use a lot of technology in that. Yeah. Um, so we'll wait till we get to audience questions before we talk about kind of your advice process technologies. Cool. Um, but just follow on from our brain and Facebook advertising. Do you guys manage that in-house or do you outsource um, third party? It's Largely outsourced. My business partner, Salvador Klein, runs a business called Global RevGen, which is a digital marketing agency. So their clients are mostly advertising agencies. Um, they handle some pretty big accounts. So they manage the AdWords and the Facebook ads and the reporting and all the media buying. Um, I would generally recommend that if you're spending $1,000 a month or more, this is something you should be outsourcing. If there is more that meets the eye and you will save your agency fees many times over in effectiveness. Okay. So before I kind of um, throw over to Adrian Paddy to, to ask some questions, and remember everyone who's watching, uh, ask questions and we'll get to them after Paddy's kind of followed up. Um, but Vince, what's the long-term strategy with uh, LifeSherpa? Are you planning on selling? Uh, are you planning on keeping it as a cash flow business for the long term? Um, and if you are looking at selling, how do you think about valuation on a business like yours? Um, well, the, the short term strategy is obviously to grow the business, but in the medium term, which by which I mean, you know, three to three to 10 years, um, this is obviously a business that, um, I'm growing to, to sell, um, yeah. despite your, your audience, um, I'm 53 today, so I'm not going to be doing this for, um, for very much longer. <laughs> um, so it's a, uh, it is clearly a business that has been built for um, for sale. Now, how do you measure that? Um, very good question. Um, the the closest proxies you can find probably are um, there's a business in the US called Hello Wallet. Some of your audience may be familiar with. They sell um, financial wellness programs to employers. So they deliver a lot of the, the education and content and 
behavior change messages that we're selling, but they don't do implementation. Um, that business was sold to Morningstar for $53 million pre-profit. Um, LearnVest, um, which is uh, one that you may be familiar with, that was a probably the first online financial planning business in the US. It was founded by a woman called Alexa Von Tobel during the, um, the tail end of the GFC, or the Great Recession, as our American friends call it. And um, she started out life as a personal finance content business, so she was a publisher in effect. And that grew into a um, financial planning. They had CFPs sitting in an office in New York and dealing with clients on the phone. And then they built a, um, a personal finance uh, tool like a pocketbook um, or a money soft or one of those tools. And they had, I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but probably a million users, like a huge number. And that business again was sold pre profit to Northwest Mutual, a uh, insurance company, for 250 million US. Um, so that business and the pocketbook business um, would have been sold largely on a, a number of users type metric. Um, but yeah, there's no great science to a lot of a lot of that. So um, yeah, so our goal is that by that stage we would be profitable, and then you apply. I am a traditional guy. You apply, you know, an EBIT multiple, which is what I did to uh, remark. Um, Pretty so I was gonna. Is, are those the sort of figures you're looking at? The two hundred million dollar mark. Is that, oh, that would be nice. Um, I mean, if you get to you know at thirty thousand members, um, then you know a, an isolate type valuations are reasonably achievable. Well, I, I, think, know, I think that's a really good segue when you're talking those. What's that? That's, that's a long way away. That's yeah, spendy. it's a lot of work to go into. It. <laughs> it's a good segue into um, what I've discussed with you before in terms of your segmentation of the Australian market. I think it'd be really interesting for you to just, um, I guess, share with the the advisors out there. Um, there's a lot of numbers that are thrown out about what is the advisable yep. uh, market, what isn't, um, what are the segments, what what are they prepared to pay? Um, for I guess for the advisors out there. If they're doing holistic advice, how big is the market for them with the an analysis you've done? Okay. Um, I mean, obviously, it's, you, know, you can draw these lines wherever you want to, but broadly, there's $5.1 billion spent in fees and commissions in Australia, and that covers retail life insurance advice, um, home loans, uh, super and non-super investment. About 18% of that is non-super investment advice which is where all the attention is. So if you think about, if you hear anything about automated advice, what are you hearing about? You're hearing about um, you know, stock spots, Clover, Ignition, um, yeah, Future Penny. You, sh you keep having, there's, there's a zillion services that will give you a model portfolio and rebalance it for you. But that's 18% of the market. And when you look at, the, exist, the number of clients that make up that advice space, um, there are about one and three quarter million households in Australia who have $100,000 or more of non-super investable assets. And if you say there's 19,000 financial planners in the country, that's about 90 ahead. So there are 90 people with $100,000 or more, or 90 households with $100,000 or more to be invested at, per advisor. And okay. Two thirds of those are over fifty-five. We can all share. Then. Sorry, but you're going to take about ten thousand of them. So what do we do? Like, well, what's no, really going to um, bring the average down? point? So, so I'll just finish that for a moment. But so two thirds of those are over fifty-five, and if you look at households who are under forty-five, uh, only four percent of them have more than a hundred thousand dollars to invest. So if you're selling a digital product, which is targeted at people under forty-five. Uh, you just can't base that business on the few who have a hundred thousand dollars or more because they're going to be expensive to find. Um, so 
having started at that premise, so pe when people talk about the other 80%, you know, the 20% um, households that, uh, that don't have a, so the 20%, the 80% 20 who don't use financial planners today, well, there's a very good reason for that, because 1.75 million households is 20% of the households in the country. So those who have um, $100,000 are actually very well serviced in this market. Um, so when you look at servicing the other 80%, you've really got to say, well, what service am I going to provide to them and what service do they actually want? So we took a group out of that other 80% and said, well, if they're in the top 60% of households by income, they're under 45 and they earn salaries and wages for their source of income. That brings you down to just under 1.7 million households. And that is a market that is largely unattractive to a traditional assets under management business, largely because they don't have it. And because they earn salaries and wages, they don't have the complexities of um, you know, family trusts or incorporated businesses or self-managed super funds. Um, so they probably don't have an accounting relationship so the traditional referral model ain't going to work. Um, and then you're going to say, well, what do they actually want? Well, they clearly don't want investment advice because they don't have any money. Um, all of our research says they don't like the word wealth because they don't think they have any. And what do we do as an industry over the last 10 years? We've rebranded everything as wealth management. Well, all these guys are saying we don't like the word wealth because we don't have any. Um, so we always talk about money or finances rather than wealth. Um, and you say, well, what do they need? Well, they need help. Um, you know, this is the, the smashed avocado generation, if you listen to Bernard Salt. They're, they're looking for help with um, paying off the debts. They're looking for help with, you know, what do I do with my ex? Um, how do I get more from my money? And how do I get myself into my first home? Um, all of those things um, are then sort of underpinned by the other services like sorting your super app um, and getting your insurance packages in place. Um, now, not it's, all of that. We've, we've got, a, we've got a, sorry to cut you off there, Vince. We've got a lot of questions that have come through from the guys. And we, it'd be great to get through them because there's, there's been so much interest in what you're doing. I've got one more before, okay. before we um, go into that, which is around the, the profiling. I really, I really think it's awesome what you're doing with the, the money profiles for people. Yeah. If, if other advisors out there want to, the majority of advisors in the industry are using pretty static sort of risk profiling tools, um, arguably uh, effective or not effective, depending who you talk to. Um, what are your suggestions for them if they want to look into um, getting a bit, uh, maybe a bit more, um, I guess, sophisticated around it and, and really start to talk to people's psychology um, when they do that process? Yeah, I mean, if this, this area of behaviour is, I think, the key to advice and obviously to generate behaviour change, you need to understand where you are and where you're going and what are the mental and behavioral barriers that stop you getting there. That's why we started with this um, personality tool. And over the past few, well, over the past year or so, I've spoken to a number of youngish advisors who would be keen on using this tool. And we've been working on a, um, trying to package it up as a widget that people could include on, on their website. Um, so, you know, if we could get a, some expressions of interest, we could uh, accelerate that, that process. Um, but getting, getting back to that, so that, that's, to my mind, critical in all of this. Um, and just to give you an example, there, there's nine money personalities in, in our tool. And one of them is um, what's called an achiever. And an achiever um, is very hands-on. They've got a high involvement score. Um, on our, on our an involvement is how interested you are in, in dealing with your money. Um, so if anyone's been around long enough, they will know that teachers and engineers generally make difficult clients. Um, and the answer to that is they actually have very generally profile as having high involvement scores. They also tend to be analytical and um, that leads to a need for more information. And we use the personality profiler to tailor the statement of advice. So if you've got a high involvement score, we'll give you more information. Um, 
So we're getting back to, so the achiever has your high involvement score, very interested, believes in hard work, and has a relatively low trust score. So they tend to be quite self-directed. And we actually, we did a, um, a test of this at the Property Investment Expo last year with the MFAA, and 90% of the profiles that we did at the Expo profiled as achievers. So that tells you that, um, you know, someone who exhibits all of those prof traits is probably highly likely to be interested and involved in property investing. Mm. So if you were running a property <coughs> advice business, you would be very interested in knowing which one of your prospects were achievers because they're the ones that you would want to spend a bit more time and effort nurturing. Um, so that whole, yeah, it, it, it surprised me. Um, I mean, we, we've got a, um, you know, we built a database now of about 3,000 profiles um, and we can compare that to a, a base model based on the US population as a whole. And yeah, so Vince, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Is there any chance you can give us a copy of the results just from obviously without any names, just so we can look at what, you know, that high achiever, what you send the clients? You can uh, yeah, you can go, okay. Everyone listening can go on the website and do this test for free. If you All right, let's do that. We'll so send you're, going to pollute, you're going to pollute my conversion metrics by doing this because obviously. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can, you can just send us one of the reports, like just a generic report yeah. that you, so we can see what the end clients look at because we don't yeah. want to be pixeled and you advertise to us because you're just going to waste <laughs> money. Um, and we, we email out to our database. So that'd be, that'd be really helpful to just to see. So if you could send that to me and we'll email that out to everyone. Yeah. Uh, I'll also include that um, comparison between our population and the property expo population. Yeah. Um, which that'd be great. I expected a skew, but I wasn't expecting that strong a skew. Yeah, that, that'd be really good. So we'll move on to audience questions because we've got heaps and sort of a, a lot of it's uh, kind of a bit technical. So uh, yeah. and I know it'll take us a while to get through them all. So Shane Hayes is asked uh, the first yeah, question. Uh, if you're providing scoped advice to clients, yeah. uh, you'll need to produce um, product advice documents, so an SOA. Uh, yeah. How are you factoring the cost of producing this doc versus uh, what a client pays you? So... Um, you're charging two ninety nine. How are you giving like specific product advice for two ninety nine? Um, that largely comes down to uh, systemization and automation. Um, the the point about oh and and the way the client gets to the point. So by the time the client gets to talk to an advisor, they have already self selected themselves into having identified a problem. So the dialogue with the client is, how do I solve this problem for the client, rather than how do I sell this product to the client? The client's already made a buying decision. They've recognised they need this solution, and our job is to help them get there. Um, so that's step number one. And that means that the advisor is a different sort of person. So you, you need a different set of skills. So if you try and think about the sole practitioner or one or two that in a traditional advice office, your ideal advisor is someone who's got a bit of grey hair, maybe not quite as much as me, but a bit of grey hair, um, is a good salesperson and um, has quite deep technical knowledge. Now that's really good if you're you know, charging the client or four hundred dollars an hour, um, and you can afford, and you can therefore pay, you know, one hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand dollars for this resource. Um, the problem with those resources is they tend to form relationships with clients, or clients form relationships with them because they're doing it one on one. Mm. So, in a traditional practice, that advisor starts to capture more and more of the revenue. And typically, that's about sixty percent of the gross revenue ends up in the pocket of the individual advisor which is why a traditional practice is actually really difficult to scale. Now, if you take away that personal relationship so that the client is um, now forming a relationship with the brand, um, that's why we do all of our communications so that the clients all email mysherpa at lifesherpa.com.au. Our phone system recognises the calling number and puts them through to the relevant advisor. 
So they don't have to think that my advisor is Joe or Mary or Pete. Um, and they relate to life show dynamics. So that allows you to um, sort of change that dynamic, which means that the advisor needs to be more of a coach, a, a customer service, a, um, you know, that's where the Sherpa concept comes from. So mm. they're, they're not necessarily, they don't need to have gun technical skills. Um, and the process that we've got in place will make sure that the same set of circumstances will give rise to the same conclusions every time. That's not to say everyone gets the same answer, but the same set of circumstances will give you the same conclusion. And that reduces your compliance costs. Um, and the process then allows the advisor to focus on that dialogue um, rather than wasting time producing what really amounts to a compliance document that the client's not actually going to read. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, so our, so our statement of advice is about, typically about 12 pages um, and is largely automated. Um, once you've done the, the advice bit, um, we then produce the document and the advisor's job really is talking through that. We're also doing fewer meetings. So a traditional, if you've ever attended any insurance um, advice uh, seminar or training course, they all talk about the three meeting process. Mm. Um, well, three one hour meetings with an advisor um, plus prep time plus documentation time. Well, actually you can't do that for $1,500 just doesn't work. Um, but if you get that service down to, you know, a, a well thought out qualification process, a set of supporting documentation, articles, videos, whatever, and a coaching, you know, 20 minute, half an hour coaching session on the phone or on Skype or on Zoom or Sweetbox, um, that's a completely different yeah. Okay, next question from Mark Rottenstein because we are quickly running out of time uh, and I know people are going to hang on to uh, listen to these responses. But um, the 299 advice feed, that includes implementing. So when you're doing insurance advice, you're implementing the insurance. Yeah, advice. No, no, we're talking about insurance, we're talking about 1500 from the commission and $25 a month for the life of the product. Okay, so if we look at if we look at super, if we just yeah, look so at your and your rolling over... Yep. So for two hundred ninety nine dollars, we will find your lost super um, consolidated recommender fund and investment choice. Okay. Next question from Shane Hayes. Oh, we'll, send you, we'll send you the form, which we have partially filled out. That you then send to the into the, um, the super fund. The super fund. Yeah, yeah. So yes. yes, it does include implementation, but we don't do self managed super funds. Yeah. And we don't do um, you know model portfolios built on super wraps. Yeah. The vast bulk of it is um, yeah, public offer of big funds. And yeah. you know, and when you when you say I'm not going to invest in any fund that's got less than four billion, five billion dollars in it, the universe is actually quite small. And based on the yeah, so we've got a, an approved product list and when you look at the client's particular requirements, it narrows down those things very quickly. Yeah. So if you want someone who wants, who, you know, someone who's got $20,000 balance and wants a, an ethical or green fund, well, there's sort of few choices. Mm. So it comes and one of them is radically cheaper than the others. Um, so by systemizing that process and making sure that the same set of circumstances gives rise to the same solution every time, you, uh, you can actually do that quite effectively. Now, yeah, there's an yeah. investment in building that process and maintaining that process, um, and that's where scale becomes important. Yeah. Next question from Shane Hayes. Have you investigated whether ongoing fee, your ongoing fee is tax deductible? The membership fee? Yeah. Uh, that will depend on the client's specific circumstances um, and what, what they want for it. Um, so if someone is has got no investments or no investment income um, and what they're getting help with is you know, managing their budget and cash flow management and debt elimination. 
uh, it's probably not deductible. Yeah. And do you tell the clients that it's deductible or not, or do they, you say, you talk to your accountant about that? Um, we provide them with some guidelines. We're actually registered with the Tax Agents Board as a financial tax advisor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we do take into account tax circumstances, but the deductibility of the $15 is... Um, yeah, not something like that. Yeah, it's not. They're not. They're not writing home about the amount of money they're saving on tax. I yeah, get it. So like a, th a, 30, a thirty-seven cent taxpayer um, on one hundred and fifty dollars a year is really yeah. not very. Much. It's not that much. Yeah. So Mark Rottenstein's asked uh, if you're recommending super and the client has insurance within that uh, super fund, are you? Um, Charging them the fifteen hundred dollars for the insurance recommendations plus the two ninety nine. Yes. So to the extent that that super, that insurance advice would require a uh, a new policy. Um, okay. Then. So so if you if your advice is uh, stick with the same super fund but maybe contribute more money, you just charge the two ninety nine. Um, yep. yep. Got it. Um, Patricia is asked. How the heck, she did, not her words, my words, how the heck can you provide <laughs> advice on such a low cost? Um, it's about um, scale and automation and processes. So we have built the whole of the, um, well, so let's have a, just look at the, the tech technology platform. We've got a, a public facing website, which the client engages with and that takes them through a whole bunch of education, a whole bunch of tools. And at the core of that is our financial freedom factor tool, which is based on um, our eight steps. And the eight steps are, um, you know, it may not sound like rocket science to your, your members, but it, it is rocket science to a lot of people. The eight steps are, you know, spend less than you earn, which is really around budgeting and tracking, um, have an emergency fund, um, pay off your debts, um, get your super sorted, prepare for emergencies, which is really around um, insurance, get your paperwork sorted, buy and pay off your home and then invest your surplus. And it gives them a score on each of those eight areas. And then that leads to tips and exercises to improve your score across each of them. So someone who's you know, arrives at the site with you know, a huge amount of credit card debt and a budget that's out of control, they're obviously gonna score you know, they'll be focused on those sort of early foundation steps. And as they work their way through those exercises, it leads them to an advice process. So the first time they actually engage with an advisor and hence incur an incremental cost is when they're actually about to do something. Mm. And, so, and just to so kind of, uh, yeah. I guess, from our conversations, you've, you've built a back-end system on Salesforce. So what I'm guessing is... Once clients fill out all this stuff and it says, well, they've got a high credit card debt, that'll fill into your system saying that the recommendation is most likely going to be pay off your credit card debt. And uh, sorry, my phone went off that time. That's okay. That's okay. So, so they fill out all these forms and that goes into your back end system, which, I mean, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, you spent a million dollars kind of setting up your technology. Yeah, so, so, all up to date, we've spent about a million dollars to get, get here. Um, yeah, so some of that is design, some of that's. Um, you know, designing the logos, designing the little man behind me, um, and a whole bunch of money building a website and um, integrating that into Salesforce and Pardot. So that technology is important. So the client only ever interfaces with the website, and through that they are completing their fact find and learning about themselves and their money and what they need to do. Yeah. As they score, they will eventually lead themselves down an advice path which says, oh, well, I need to sort out this income protection stuff. What's that all about? So there's a whole bunch of tools there that explains how it all works. And um, at that point, we then have a, so they'll say, you know, fill in the form and say, give me some help with my income protection. And at that point, we have a either a phone or sweet box dialogue with, with the client. We're taking through the, the issues and what's concerned. That then spits out a, you know, statement of advice which mm. is out of um, Salesforce using a tool called Conga and um, that process statement of advice takes about 45 minutes um, that the real work is leading the client through the, the process and the biggest 
part of that is dealing with when the underwriting comes back and there's a, a qualification for a loading on it. And that's where most losses happen. Yeah, yeah. At which point you've spent all your advice money. Um, yeah. So getting that right is pretty critical. So that's where this coaching approach comes in. That The client's already done the sale, so you're not selling them at that point. Um, that's right. Actually, well, look, the fact that they've limited stuff to your left shoulder, um, well, you know, how important is that when you know, most claims are for stroke, cancer, heart attacks? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so next question we're going to keep pushing on uh, uh, is from Andrew Dooley. He's asked, uh, where does the commission rebate come from? So do you pay that? Uh, the commissions come from the product providers to you and you pay it out to the clients uh, or do right. yep. you set up an arrangement? No, we, so, we, so we take the money from the insurance company or the lender. Um, that goes into our system and then works out that this client is a current member and we deduct yeah, fifteen hundred or twenty-five from an ongoing commission, and um, that's just an internal in, internal system that you guys use to rebate. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Next it's question. Spreadsheet at the moment, but it will eventually be a bit more sophisticated. Just, uh, smokes and mirrors, Vince. We'll tell people it's really complicated. Um, it is complicated. But yeah. It's a very big one. Yeah, that's right. Um, all right. Where do you, we've kind of touched on this, but we'll we'll um, ask it again. Where do you get your leads from, and how do you direct traffic onto your website? Is it majority from Facebook advertising? Yeah. Uh, well, it's primarily paid. We do get a little bit of um, organic traffic. Um, our credit card and hex articles seem to create quite a lot of traffic on their own. So we somehow yes. we must rank very well for those. But the View that we took, at least in the early days, was that you know, we spend ten thousand dollars on buying Facebook ads. We know we're going to get prospects. Um, if we spend ten thousand dollars on search engine optimization, you might get more traffic. Mm. Um, and it sort of doesn't matter whether you're on page six or page fifty of the Google search results. If you're not in the first ten, it sort of doesn't matter where you are. Um, so we've generally been buying traffic. Yeah, and that's primarily Facebook, like 80% of our budget would be Facebook and the, um, and the other would be Outbrain. Outbrain would be 20 and then retargeting Google AdWords. To yeah. The balance. Okay. Ben Nash has asked, uh, what is it typical to, 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 I'll talk properly soon. What is the <laughs> typical time frame between a member joining, uh, as, on the free service and engaging in advice transaction? So maybe, maybe once they sign up for the $15 a month, how long does it take them normally to, um, um, get advice? Um, that's actually one that surprised me. Um, the business model was based on a, you know, a, a conversion rate over time. Um, so the assumption being that um, you know, someone would sign up for a free trial and then if they're going to convert, they'll convert over the next 90 or 120 days. And then sometime over the next three or four years, they'll buy a home loan or insurance policy. That was the, the business plan. What we're finding is that the conversion rate from paid to product is much faster and higher than the business model was suggesting. Um, now, that might be an early adopter effect. It might be the fact that people are holding off paying their $15 until they're closer to um, paying a service. We don't really know yet. Um, but, you know, we've... Um, you know, something like... 60% of those who signed up since April have acquired another service apart from them. I think a staggeringly high number that I really wasn't expecting. Yeah. Whether it yeah. continues or not, who knows? And I suspect it will fall over time. Okay. But there's, there's an assumption in there that, um, you know, based on the number of um, home loan, you know, if you take a, a cohort of 25 to 45 year olds, we know that 60% of them will be homeowners and therefore have a mortgage and they'll average, on average they'll refinance every seven years. Therefore, 7% of members should take out a home loan every year. Mm. That's the sort of analysis we did and um, we are tracking ahead of all of those. Now, some of that self-selection, the fact that people who are interested enough to pay $15 a month 
um, are probably more likely to be in that market than exactly yeah they're more they're more likely to engage with you as a mortgage broker because they're they're interested in their finances and they're not yeah. um, just ignoring it so we've got two more questions one from patricia again um does and we, we kind of answered it so it's probably a yes or no question um do the clients ever see an advisor when they get the advice uh online they do yeah. not physically we don't do house calls and you can come to our office but we do conferences like this so we use sweetbox and um Skype or Zoom. Great. Last question from Mark Rottenstein. Thank you very much for everyone who's hung around. Um, we are uh, 13 minutes over time, um, oh, but this is the last one for the year and it's been fantastic. Um, so Mark said, uh, "Is it? it's just all about scale and we have kind of answered this, but how many clients have you produced an SOA for um, and what's the scale of the business at the moment? Um, also, because of you have because you have this funnel, um, the number we focus on is the number of um, member interactions, and that's in the in the three thousands. Um, the yeah numbers of statement of advice is still in double digits, um, and yeah. But given that we really started in April of this year, that's um, that's pretty satisfactory. But the key to this is you know spending money on client acquisition, and mm. that's really where our current financing round is is focused so we're at you know trying to raise some um, some series a funding to, to to grow the business and that's where all that money will get spent okay all right so you you've hooked me in for a little, few more questions sorry vince as soon as you talk about talk about I'm, sorry, I'm, 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 I'm happy to, to I'm, uh, how how are you how are you valuing the business per per client you have on the books because you you wouldn't be valuing it the same as advice businesses are no um, I mean, valuation of startups is such a black art. Um, people will tell you that there's all sorts of science in this and you can use a per user metric or you can use a, um, a um, yeah, all sorts of. Okay, all, sorts all right. Maybe, maybe um, let's so to, to answer your question is there are six accepted methodologies which are sort of based on um, you know, stage of business, they're based on... Um, and which method are you using, Vince? Um, well, they all come up with a number between two and six million. Um, okay. And so we're uh, trying to raise money in sort of the middle of that range. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of people talk about having massive valuations up front, but it's actually a rod for your own back. It, for the amount of extra business you have to give away, you're much better off having a, a first round at two or three million and um, delivering on your promise and then doing the next round at 50 or 100 rather than doing yeah. the first one 20 and having to come back and do a second one at 10. Yeah. That will so how much so, how much equity are you um, giving up in this first round? What's the, what's the aim for the um, We're looking to um, give away up to about a quarter of the business. Yeah. And I mean, it's pretty compelling offer if... if um, you said that you spending a hundred dollars per client, and you get lifetime value of so three the grand. Model. We're, not, we're not actually achieving a hundred today, um, but that's our expectation. We've modelled numbers from you know, fifty to seven hundred, and um, it works. But the but our, case, if, our case case is based on achieving a hundred dollars by you know, year two. Even if you even if you're doing four times that, you're paying four hundred dollars for a three thousand dollar lifetime value of a client. Yeah. Um, and then that's pretty good unit economics for, for the That's client. right. So you compare that to iSelect. You know, iSelect spent $160 to acquire a client that's worth $800. Yeah. All right. I'm going to stop geeking out over... over. I think you're going to have to book Vince in next year sometimes. Yeah. So totally six months from now. Sorry, I didn't catch that, Adrian. Uh, maybe book you in about six months from now, see how everything's tracking, Vince. That's right. So hopefully by then I'll have a, a few more of your team occupying the desks around this office that's right so if anyone's got uh half a million to you know 1.5 million dollar check and ready to invest in the life sherpa then then <laughs> it'll take the phone call um so thank you everyone who stuck around uh, this is the last one for the year uh it's been a fantastic year and and the xy crew in sydney had a big uh, event on monday and from all reports uh, it was fantastic. Not even just from the XY crew. I've got I've got a few phone calls yesterday from people uh, saying that they had an amazing time. 
Um, so well done, Adrian, for putting that on. That was some good form. Everyone was in great form up here. That's very good. Very cheery. Yeah. So we've, we've got heaps happening next year, guys. Uh, we're going, XY Lives is going weekly from the, uh, from February, the start of Feb. Uh, we are going weekly. So we're going to do 45 XY Lives in 2017. And we've got a, um, a sponsor, AIA, coming on board um, and sponsoring uh, XY Live. So heaps happening. We've got two events in Sydney next year, one event in Melbourne for the first time. Uh, so things are cranking along at XY Advisor. So thank you, Vince, for um, an amazing last session for the year. Thanks for having me. And thanks, Paddy, for finally coming on uh, and, and joining us. Apologies, everyone. I think you don't have to worry about me. The quality of the content was um, enough to uh, forget about, but everyone got to see me walk through the city this morning. So. Exactly. So thank session. you very much, Vince. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Have an awesome Christmas, uh, and I hope you're all having a big break and having a relax and taking a big breather. So thank you, everyone, and we'll see you next year. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Yes. Thanks.